The race to design the most powerful computer processors is one of the most intense sports in the tech industry. When Lisa Su, an engineer by training, took over AMD in 2014, she not only became the first female CEO of a major semiconductor company, she also kicked off one of the biggest transformations in industry history, turning a lagging maker of low-end chips into a juggernaut known for the superior performance of its products. Shares are up more than 2,000% under her tenure. And AMD chips, short for advanced micro devices, are now embedded in everything from Microsoft's Xbox to Sony PlayStation and Apple Macs to massive data center machinery. Semiconductors, the brains, or you could call them the guts of all of our devices, never got that much glory until the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, when demand for chips shot up so much so fast it triggered an unprecedented global shortage, raising alarm from Washington to Beijing. Joining me now to talk about when the chip shortage will end, how she turned the company around, and what's next for AMD, on this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, AMD CEO Lisa Su. You called 2020 an inflection point for AMD, given the robust demand for everything from PCs to consoles to data centers and laptops. If 2020 was an inflection point, what's 2021? <laughs> it's a great question, um, Emily. You know, I, I think when you look at um, the pace of technology, right, we, we, uh, we've been developing, you know, these technologies for like, you know, five years, right? So we made these decisions on, hey, this is where computing is going. And um, 2020 was a phenomenal year. You know, we grew revenue 45% uh, year on year. It was an inflection point for our business. Now, as we come to 2021, what we see is it's a mega cycle for, um, for compute. I mean, it's like, um, you know, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, would we have this kind of demand, uh, whether you're talking about, um, you know, PCs or gaming products or the data center, I, I, I would have been surprised. And so it's a mega cycle for compute. And on top of that, um, you know, we have, you know, just extremely strong, you know, product portfolio and, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's a mega cycle. That's what I would call 2021. AMD chips are at the heart of the Sony PlayStation, Microsoft Xbox, laptops of all kinds, Apple's Mac Pro, Amazon data centers, what are the new products that you have targeted to meet this new demand? Well, so for AMD, our, um, our focus, sort of what we're good at is um, high performance computing. So when you think about, you know, um, you know, computing and processors, they're really, you know, the brains of, uh, you know, all of the things that, uh, that we use on a daily basis. And, um, you know, so for our products, it's around um, high performance PCs. So, you know, when you're thinking about your, you know, next generation notebook um, and uh, you're thinking about all the productivity you want, I hope you're thinking about AMD. Um, it's the next generation game consoles or actually the current generation game consoles. I think uh, Microsoft and Sony with um, Xbox and PlayStation have just put out phenomenal products that are extremely um, extremely exciting and, and we're proud to be a part of that. And then it is about your data center and, and what's beneath, you know, what's, what's you know, sort of behind the scenes and, um, you know, all the digital transformation that companies are doing, the fact that, you know, we all pivoted to work from home and, and running, you know, large scale businesses, um, you know, from our study. I mean, that re requires incredible computing horsepower in the back end um, in the cloud or in on-prem data centers. So those are the types of products that, uh, that we're in. How far in advance do you plan your products and how do you know you'll have what the world wants by the time they're ready? That, that is, the, in fact, uh, the most difficult thing and probably the most fun thing. It's, it's, it's really, we have to think three to five years in advance and we have to think, hey, these are the things that are going to be most important and it's about uh, providing, you know, more performance and smaller form factors. It's about um, having, uh, you know, very extended battery life. It's about uh, providing new experiences. Um, it's about enabling companies and businesses to do something that they couldn't do before. And we do plan years in advance, but I will tell you, Emily, what this year has taught us is we can turn on a dime. And um, we have been uh, very actively, you know, working with our customers, working with our partners on what their top priorities are. And, um, and that turning on a dime has uh, proven to be a, a very useful, uh, you know, capability. Meantime, the chip shortage, I've been talking to a lot of chip industry CEOs over the last several months, and it sounds like it has been a 
disaster. You have demand outstripping supply by more than 30 percent. What are you seeing? You know, I don't think I would use the word um, disaster, Emily. I would use the word um, it is a uh, it is a cycle. And you know, semiconductors. You know, I mean, I've been in this industry whatever 25 years or a long time. You know, semiconductors do go through these cycles, and the cycles where there's sometimes when um, supply is much greater than demand, and there's sometimes when demand is much greater than supply. And this particular cycle is special because um, what we're seeing is um, the incredible demand for all things um, that require chips is, is having sort of all markets, um, you know, sort of wanting more uh, more, more supply, and yes, it's a lot to manage, but I have to tell you, um, this industry is also really good at managing these things, and um, you know, it, it does take a while for the supply and demand um, you know, imbalance to, uh, to balance itself out, um, but we are very much working together as an industry, and you know, I'm just amazed, frankly, at what people are able to do when they really put their minds to it. Once the shortage ends, then is there going to be too much supply? Will supply outpace demand? Well, um, as cycles go, you know, you do go through ups and downs. I, I think what's important, Emily, is um, it's it's also the strength of um, the product portfolio, the markets um, that we're addressing. You know, at AMD, we've chosen markets um, that we think are very resilient. Like everyone's going to need more computing. You know, whether it's this year, 2022, 2023, uh, we just think commuting, computing is one of those trends. That, um, that you're gonna need more of. And so we've been investing in those types of areas. So you know, my view of the world is that um, it's important to have the right products, it's important to be in the right markets, and then, um, of course, uh, you know, executing well uh, um, along the way. AMD is one of several companies that has sent a letter to President Biden urging him to include more funding for chip manufacturing and research in the United States adding that, that, you know, it's competition with China, it's competition with Taiwan that is at stake. What do you think the U.S. needs to do? Well, I think the, um, the U.S. Uh, is the leader in semiconductors, and we want to stay the leader in semiconductors. And frankly, um, you know, many of um, the countries around the world are investing in the same. Um, and then there's also a discussion about manufacturing and uh, ensuring that there's a good balance of manufacturing across um, the globe as well. So I think you know all of those um, kind of raise the level of importance of semiconductors, and I think it's um, it's uh, great that the administration is choosing you know this industry as one of the priorities uh, to ensure that you know the U.S. maintains its leadership um, in semiconductors. AMD chose Taiwan Semiconductor to make AMD chips, and I wonder is there something about Taiwan? We, you know, what is the reason for this very prolific industry there, and you know, producing so much top tech? chip talent. Um, is there something about the island that makes it so fruitful? We're very happy with our partnership with you know, Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're actually the best in the industry. And so you know, when we th think about taking our design you know, capability, which we think is you know, at the top of the industry, and combine it with their manufacturing expertise that's the best in, in, this, in, in the industry, that's how you get sort of the best products. And, um, and so certainly we're, we're, we're happy with that. But I, I think the, the key is sort of investing in that long-term nature and ensuring that you have um, you know, the right uh, capabilities um, for this industry. Because frankly, it, it does take you know, many, many you know, double-digit billions to um, uh, keep pushing the leading edge. Meantime, here in the US, you have many trillion-dollar companies, Apple, Amazon, Google, bringing their chip designs in-house. Where does that leave AMD? Does that feel like a, a competitive threat? Well, I look at it um, slightly differently. I look at it as the, um, you know, the importance of computing in all products is, is just going up and up and up. And so, as you see, you know, there will always be some specialization and, you know, um, you know, very, very, um, you know, some, some of the companies you mentioned, you know, certainly Amazon and Apple are very, very strong companies. Um, they will do some specialization um, of their chips. Um, that being the case, I mean, you know, we just started with, you know, 2021 is, you know, sort of we're in a mega cycle of computing, right? So um, I think, you know, our role is really to push the envelope on computing and continue to raise the performance and the capabilities, um, you know, for all applications. 
Then there's, of course, Intel and NVIDIA with also a big pool of resources. Intel has a new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, who's coming out strong, saying Intel is back. Um, when the competition has a lot of money and some would say momentum, how do you view that competition? Well, it's always been very competitive, Emily. I don't, I don't remember a time in this industry when it hasn't been competitive. Um, what I will say, though, is um, I'm really, really pleased with our, you know, what we've been able to accomplish. I mean, it's, it's fun to be able to say that you know, we have uh, you know, really driven you know, the direction of computing in the industry. I mean, it's fun to be able to say that. And if I look at you know, some of the things that we've done over the last five years, you know, we've really you know, changed you know, sort of what people expect. Um, from high performance computing. So uh, I, I would say it's a competitive world and, and you know, we're gonna be uh, very competitive in the process. NVIDIA is in the process of buying ARM. Do you see more consolidation in this industry or have we hit a tipping point? Well, I think for the um, highest um, end, sort of the, the bleeding edge of technology, um, you know, scale is important. So when, you're, uh, when you have more engineering capability, when you have a larger supply chain, um, when you have a, um, a bigger impact on your customers, um, you know, sort of uh, you know, innovation, you know, scale is important. Um, you know, we're very excited uh, right now that uh, you know, we are um, in the process of uh, acquiring Xilinx. Um, you know, Xilinx is you know, number one in the um, FPGA market and um, accelerated computing market. You know, as we think about bringing that together with um, you know, AMD's technology, we'll be able to offer more capability and um, you know, more um, you know, overall system design you know, for our customers. So I do think consolidation is one of the trends um, in the industry. Does that mean AMD is going to keep looking for deals? We're very focused on um, you know, completing our Xilinx acquisition. We're on track to do that by the end of this year. And you know, we'll always be looking for you know, how do we bring you know, the best technologies together um, under the AMD umbrella. Did you ever think you were going to be a CEO, let alone a CEO of one of the biggest chip companies in the world? Being a CEO of a, of a semiconductor company and being CEO of AMD really is, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it, it is like a dream job. You're an engineer by training. You're also an immigrant. You came to the U.S. from Taiwan at an early age. Tell us a little bit more about your upbringing. Like, what was it like growing up, Lisa Sue? Yeah, sure. So um, I was born in Taiwan, and um, you know, my uh, my parents immigrated to the U.S. My dad was uh, was coming um, to uh, to graduate school here, um, so I grew up in New York. Um, I would say. Pretty normal, Emily. <laughs> Pretty normal uh, New York, uh, New York uh, upbringing. Um, my parents wanted me to focus on, you know, hard stuff. So math and science is uh, where I spent um, a lot of time. But uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, I sort of drifted into engineering as as something that uh, was, um, you know, sort of real and you could touch it and feel it and do something with it. And um, and that's uh, that was so, sort of how I grew up. Well, I want to talk about how the drifting happened because I understand your, your father was a statistician, your mom ran her own business, you played around with your brother's toys, I believe, um, at a young age. Like, how did you get there? Well, um, Emily, I was just really curious as a kid. And so, you know, you know my, my brother had a remote controlled car and it stopped working and I wanted to know why. Right, so I, you know, I, I opened it up and said, "Oh, this wire is loose. Maybe if I put it there, it, it, it works again." And it was just really amazing, frankly. It was amazing to see that you could, uh, you know, make something sort of, you know, work, and you could understand how you could put these things together. And uh, you know, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, uh, which was very science focused, and so I got, you know, some. Uh, uh, you know, I learned about computers um, in uh, in high school, and uh, you know that's uh, those are th those are some of the steps. You worked your way through the engineering and technical ranks of various companies: Texas Instruments, IBM. You were Lou Gerstner, the CEO's technical assistant for a time. Freescale Semiconductor. Did you ever think you were going to be a CEO, let alone a CEO of one of the biggest chip companies in the world? 
You know, I, I wouldn't say that I thought about that. I think um, the way I thought about things was always, um, you know, I wanted to make a larger impact. And so, you know, I spent a lot of years at IBM and, uh, you know, it was the first time that I built products that you could actually, you know, go buy, you know, at, you know, the Best Buy or, and um, I found, boy, that's, that's pretty interesting. And with each opportunity, I got to, you know, to run larger and larger teams. Um, I would say, uh, you know, being a CEO of a, of a semiconductor company and being CEO of AMD really is, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it, it is like a dream job. You know, it's, it's something that you don't quite say that that's what you want to be when you grow up, but you know, when you grow up, it's kind of a nice thing to, to be, so. It was so interesting going back and, and looking at the history of AMD because you started at the company when analysts were worried AMD was going to run out of money after several straight years of losing money. I believe shares at the end of 2015 were trading at $2.87. Now they're trading at 30 times that. What drove you to take on that challenge in that moment back in 2014? I start from the notion that what we do is uh, just like really hard. There are very few companies in the world <laughs> that can do it. And uh, the opportunity to lead AMD and at the time, you're right, you know, there were some people who were like, hey, you know, are they going to be able to get this together and, and so on and so forth. But I knew in my heart, I mean, I, I've seen it over and over and over. Um, if you have the right strategy and you have the right people and you have the right focus and execution, you will be able to do something amazing. So what do you think was responsible strategically for AMD's comeback? We made a couple of very good decisions. We said, first of all, our strategy was to focus on what we're very good at and that's high performance computing. And that means that there were some things that we were not so good at. And we said, that's okay. We're not gonna be the best at everything. Um, and then we really did focus on the foundation, Emily. I mean, I know this sounds you know, simple, but um, it does take five years you know, to, to really build the foundation step-by-step step of what, um, uh, you know, how you build products and making sure that we're, um, you know, we're, we're really pushing the leading edge. And then on top of that, um, you know, we built great relationships with our customers. And, you know, we started with the notion of, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And let's work on that together. Um, so, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, we put, um, you know, really, um, you know, great team, um, you know, right strategy, strong execution. And, you know, my mantra is we do what we say we're going to do. Now that Wall Street is happy, does that mean you can relax a little or does that create even more pressure to be excellent? Without a doubt, um, it does not get easier. <laughs>
to people out there who look at you and think like, how did she achieve what seems to be impossible? I would say that um, it is a time where um, we want to recognize um, great people and give them, you know, um, you know, good opportunities. What was really important for me in my career is that um, that I was given opportunities, and, and frankly, I, I learned through each one of those opportunities. And so, what I would say for for women is um, who are aspiring to do big things, you know, be ambitious in what you think about. Be ambitious in what you think about. Um, you know, um, I, I have a saying that, uh, that a mentor once told me about running towards problems. You know, take on that big, hard task. Uh, even if you don't know how to do it, you're going to learn a tremendous amount in the process. And, um, and frankly, you're going to surprise yourself about how much you can do. And, you know, what we have to do as, you know, the rest of the ecosystem is provide those opportunities and provide people an opportunity to learn and maybe make a few mistakes along the way. But, you know, really, um, you know, develop um, as they uh, as they go through you know, their careers. Do you think mentorship is is really important in the own sort of next your own next chapter of your career? I, I really do, Emily. I mean, you know, again, I'm a product of people who helped me along the way, and um, I I really really recognize that. I mean, I was given opportunities that other people didn't have, um, and um, I feel like I can do the same. And in particular. Uh, for women in engineering, that's a particular passion of mine because, um, you know, frankly, they're not enough, and um, and women are sometimes a little bit shy in their, you know, in their approach to things. And so, you know, if if I can provide that um, a little bit of confidence and a little bit of help uh, to some of um, our, you know, top, um, you know, the top, uh, you know, engineering talent of of uh, the future, you know, that's something that I should do, and and I love doing. Meantime, the chip industry has been defined for so long by Moore's Law and this idea that you can double the amount of computing crammed onto a single chip every couple of years. Are we at a point where Moore's Law could be ending? Can chips get even smaller than they actually are? So I do believe that Moore's Law is significantly changing. That's the way we should say it. So, um, and it's changing because you know the traditional ways that we have, you know, shrunk chips and put more transistors on a chip. You know, those things are just getting harder. Like you're reaching, you know, physical limits. Um, but there are other things that we're doing um, to, uh, you know, to keep that productivity increase. Um, you know, one of the things that we pioneered was this idea of chiplets. And so, what that means is we can. You know, we can break up a big chip into little chips, and we can package them together, and we can put them on top of each other, and we can do all kinds of things that really brings uh, more capability into um, the uh, technology realm. So I think Moore's Law is changing. Um, I think uh, what that means is, you know, uh, other things like packaging um, and um, you know, using uh, using different techniques will be more important. Um, but one of the things that I truly believe, though, is that um, the innovation is not going to stop at all. And, and there, there are so many ideas for how do you keep the uh, productivity um, increases going on that, um, that will, will continue to drive uh, real capability. It'll just be done in a different way. So what about what's next for you? How long do you see yourself running? AMD? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I'm having so much fun, Emily, that um, there is uh, there's no better place to be, honestly. If you're if you're thinking about um, you know really having the opportunity to interact with so many smart people in, in in this type of ecosystem, and and you know chips are fun now, right? Everybody's talking about chips, so uh, this is a a great place to be. Lisa Sue, CEO of AMD, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have you.